Welcome to Herd Immunity News. I'm Marcus Botza. Today, I have the great pleasure in welcoming back Mr. Noel Wilcox. Noel came to prominence in the UK news when he took on Ulez, Sadiq Khan, Transport for London, and he won his case against his ridiculous fines that the court found was unlawful. But Noel's taken on another task and another challenge quite happily. And this one is linked to the Child Maintenance Service. Hey. I'm Noel, how are you, sir? I'm very well, Marcus. Thank you so much for your kind words. Well, listen, it's great to know that there are people like yourself that have the cojones to step forward and take these cases on. Now, the case that we're going to talk about today has been highlighted by a gentleman called Brian Hudson. Brian's done a report off his own bat and he's compiled as much information as possible as he can towards the situation of men who are being asked to pay money on maintenance for children. You're going to go on to allude to the fact that bank accounts are being frozen, funds are being taken out without any permission of the account holders, and this is ending up with people, men, tragically taking their lives, although we will have to note that this affects everybody, especially the parents of these men that are taking their lives because the men are finding themselves in a perilous position where they've got nowhere to go and no one to turn to. And this is where you come in. No, take it away. Yes. So Brian Hudson completed a series of freedom of information requests. I believe it was from 2017 to 2020. And shockingly, the mortality rate is into the thousands um, amongst parents with arrears. Right. And it's really, really, really shocking, the data that you're reading. So basically, what he's done through the Freedom of Information requests in his study, he's worked out what the life expectancy is of a certain age range. And what he's concluded in his reports is that paying parents with arrears, and what I want to do is come on and explain the arrears. Sure, sure. Paying parents with arrears, that they're 14 times more likely to be dead. Right. For their actual age range, mm -hmm. which is quite shocking, really. It is. Well, it's disgraceful. It is absolutely disgraceful. And the point that I covered mm. in the James English interview, mm. the arrears is extremely controversial because the DWP and the Child Maintenance Service and Gingerbread, Gingerbread is the charity for uh, receiving parents. Right. And they've been pumping out through the media that there's a figure of 3.8 to 4 billion pounds in arrears that's owed. And the thing that I really want to clarify right here with you now, Marcus, yes. is the CMS was set up to deal with financial arrangements, but they've pumped it through the media that they go after feckless fathers, mm. deadbeat dads, absent parents, all of these names, which I believe, you know, is completely discriminatory against mm. fathers. And is completely unacceptable because it's not true. And they've been pumping propaganda out through the press, which they know is false. And I'll tell you now how we know that this is false, that this £4 billion does not exist. And I'm happy to divulge into the detail of this. So when it was the old child support agency, the CSA, which was set up in 1993, what the old CSA used to do was a tactic that HMRC used. So what they would do, they would inflate your income by 300% as a scare tactic. So if they wanted you to pay £100 a week, mm -hmm. they would assess you at £300 a week, and you'd really start getting all the nasty letters coming through the door, the very threatening, nasty letters coming through the door. And when that paying parent got in touch with the agency and they agreed what 
the salary was of that paying parent. So if that paying parent was paying the £100 a week, the £200 a week extra that they've been assessed on, you would grow in the 1993 and 2003 accounts because the corrections were never carried out at the time. So the paying parent would start paying the £100 a week, but the £200 a week would keep building up in the arrears balance. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Yeah. So that figure grew to a staggering £3.798 billion. That was the level of fraudulent assessments that they were carrying out against paying parents. They have admitted to that. So Noel, we know this because Noel Shanahan, who was the CMS director in 2012, when he was at the Public Accounts Committee, and we upload those links afterwards, he gives the evidence of exactly what they were doing. And what he does allude to, and what he certainly suggests, is that there were parents at the time who were paying the uh, the inflated assessments. I think it's 300% increase. Yes, it's a 300% increase. Yeah. yeah, sorry. So that's... that's what they would do. So they would inflate. So they were calling it an interim maintenance assessment. Yeah. That's exactly what they called it. And, they, and that was the tactic that they deployed at the time of 300% inflation of a paying parent's income. But were they given any evidence for this? Were they going to the HMRC to say no. that this is your wage? So they were just taking a guess at it. it. Yes, exactly. So I think that they worked on the law of probability. Wow. Yeah. So if you were a postman, they might say uh, you were earning, you know, £25,000 a year. Um, you know, if you were a sergeant in the army, they might say you're earning £34,000 a year. Mm. That's what they would do. But then what they would do is inflate that income by 300%. And this is, for them, this is from the findings of Brian Hudson, who himself is a, is a father in this situation, I take it. No, he, Brian Hudson hasn't, um, he hasn't, he hasn't gone on about, you know, what the, what the arrears were. He's just right. simply stating that parents mm -hmm. with these arrears okay yeah are 14 times likely to die to die and yeah, obviously that's, that's... he has to the, the, they're being careful about the word suicide aren't they and the term suicide because that's something that is going to complicate matters more but we'll leave it for people to work out for themselves what's actually going on well the reason why we can't call it suicide yeah is because the DWP and the Child Maintenance Service are refusing to release the names under data protection. They're refusing to release the names to Brian right. Hudson, right. who can then check the death certificate to see what the actual cause of death, death was. That is how we can determine, you know, whether or not that person who is dead with the arrears, mm. how we can determine what their cause of death was. And how likely is he to ever get hold of that clarification? No. Well, the only way that we'll ever get hold of that information is with a public inquiry and public right. pressure. Yeah, I think I think there has to be public pressure that's put on the government that that data has to be released. Yeah, because yeah. I believe that it is in the public's interests that the public absolutely know what's going on. So the only reason why I, I wanted to kind of just divert slightly mm -hmm. to the arrears is just so that your listeners understand what's happened. Sure. So what has happened is that balance of 3.798 billion of a debt that's never existed and it's proven that it's not existed. And the National Audit Office, um, do you want me to explain who the NAO is? Because not a lot yeah, of people would know. Please who, do. Please, yeah. define, please define these uh, groups. Yeah, so the National Audit Office basically regulate government spending. That's pretty much their role. So they're auditors. So they come in and they audit government practice um, and, you know, how the money's being spent um, and what the value of money is for the taxpayer. Yeah, so they are independent. And astonishingly, the National Audit Office have refused to sign off the accounts of the Child Maintenance Service since its inception. Since 2012, they refused to give it a certificate of, of efficiency. And the reason for that is, is because the K-1 
calculations on the 1993 and 2003 schemes um, are not compliant with child maintenance legislation. And Joshua Redway in March 2022, who was the director of the National Audit Office, he also gave evidence and he um, told the Public Accounts Committee mm -hmm. that parents are certainly being pursued for debts where there's no evidence to substantiate that they owe that money. And what recourse so, did... Sorry, on you go. So, in essence, what's been going on, Marcus, mm -hmm. the debt of $3.798 billion has been carried over into the child maintenance service because they had no powers to write it off. Right. And what they've been doing is distributing those figures onto paying parents' accounts. And you have, so, you have instances of money being seized from bank accounts. Well, exactly. So in essence, what would happen is, is that a paying parent would go on their portal in the, in the morning. Um, you know, I'm just simply putting figures out, out sure. there at the moment, just for the purposes of everyone understanding. Right. So if a paying parent was paying, uh, let's say, £100 a week for their child, all of a sudden when I'll go on their portal uh, in the morning or whenever it might be, there will be all of these arrears that are added to their account with no explanation, mm. no statement, no anything. The minute that a paying parent then would object to these arrears, what would happen is they would be labelled non-compliant. And non-compliant is the key word here because that starts the enforcement process of the child maintenance service. And I, I can tell you now, the powers that these people have, mm. I mean, I, I cannot believe the level of power this agency has with mm. no accountability, with no checks and balances. You've mm. got the National Audit Office who are clearly stating that these people can't add up. Yeah. And they are being allowed to, as you've said, they've been allowed to go into paying parents' bank accounts mm. and take this amount of money. So if they would say, all of a sudden, you've got 15,000 pounds of arrears, you mm. say, can you provide the evidence of that? They'll say you're non-compliant and then they'll start that enforcement process. They'll freeze your bank account and then they will take that amount of money from your account if they see it's in there. But I have known cases and I'm currently dealing with a case at the moment yeah. where a case was closed in 2013. So this paying parent, he paid through the system. No issues at all. The case was closed. And in 2019, they wrote to him saying that he owed £2,832 in arrears. They went into his bank account and they took £19,000 out of his bank account. My God. And I mean, I'm listening to the evidence and I'm seeing the evidence sure. of what's going on. And it's quite disturbing and very shocking that this is going on. And I would say that this is th this is definitely a crime and it has been crimed by the police as mandate fraud really yes They've categorized it as fraud that this agency and then the the recovery groups these debt collectors have just gone in boots first without any legal backing whatsoever other than this de department's say so and they've got mm -hmm. the green light to have it away with these men's funds absolutely Wow. And not only can they go into your bank account and raid your bank account. Yeah. And I use that term quite loosely, raid. Sure. sure. Well, it yeah. is. It, it, it literally is. Yeah. Um, they can also write to your employer and demand that your employer gives them uh, a deductions earning order from your wages as well with no checks and balances. And that employer is immediately threatened if they push back against that. They will, you know, they, they will... It's a very, very nasty organization from what I've seen and how they operate. And everything that they do is severe bullying tactics that they deploy. I was going to ask you, what legal pushback have you heard from the fathers that you've been involved with? They have absolutely no legal recourse whatsoever. They can't get legal aid. No solicitors will touch it. Really? Lawyers won't touch it. Barristers won't touch it. The minute an assessment's made against you, and we know that it's fraudulent, the minute that an assessment's made against you, 
that that is pretty much it. Mm. You either pay what they tell you to, or they are going to come after you with real serious enforcement mm. powers. Sure. We'll go through their enforcement powers so that mm. your viewers know what they've got. A direct earn, earning order, which is where they can go direct to your employer. Mm -hmm. As we've just spoken about, they can freeze your bank accounts and seize money. Mm -hmm. They can remove your driving license. They can remove your passport. They can force the sale of your property. And they can send you to prison. So they basically screw your life completely. No, that's what you're saying. And, and these men feel that they don't have any recourse. That This is up to now. This is a this is a changing beast. This is a fluid situation because the more we find out about the law, as in your example, with the, the ULES fines, how you challenged them, the fines were found to be unlawful. This sounds to me like it's unlawful as well, to be honest with you. It hasn't been put under the spotlight in the cool light of day. That's why we're talking about it. Well, I mean, I would certainly say that the law is being flouted. I mean, yes. you know, I've, I've I've studied the Child Support Act 1991. Yeah, okay. so that's the that's the law that they use, um, and they only pick and choose the bits. From what I've seen with a lot of cases, they only mm. pick and choose the bits that they like to use. They certainly like the enforcement part of that act. Right. They, they definitely like that, where that's all about liability orders. Um, these liability orders, I mean, the damage that they can do with these liability orders, and there is absolutely no checks and balances whatsoever. And there's currently a case in the High Court at the moment with um, an activist called Craig Bullman. And Craig has gone for a declaration of incompatibility mm. regarding... Section 33, subsection 4 of the Child Support Act. And what it categorically states in black and white, and this is the bit that the CMS used to their full advantage. Yes. It ties the hands of the judges, the magistrates. And how it does that, it precludes the magistrate from checking the calculations of the child maintenance service. Now, Marcus, does this sound a bit like Judge Dredd here? Well, totally, totally. There's no fair trial. There's no judicial process here whatsoever. And it just seems like game, set and match to the uh, child maintenance service. So you've got the National Audit Office that say mm -hmm. that these people can't add up, but yet yeah. they're allowed to walk into a courtroom and yeah. their barristers will completely tie the hands of the judge mm -hmm. and they'll just keep saying section 33, subsection 4. and the judge has no other option but to grant a liability order against that paying parent. But the ironic thing is here, yes. and how this system's working, is that the child maintenance service have no evidence mm -hmm. that you owe that money, but the paying parent has all the evidence that they don't owe that money. Right. But they're not allowed to provide that evidence to the court. Whereas normally the bur the burden of of evidence is on the uh, on the accuser, not the accused, but this way it's almost like the other way around. But when the the accused tries to offer any evidence, you're saying to us that they're being blocked. It, it uh, one million percent, one million percent, they're being blocked. I mean, I'm actually attending court uh, this coming Thursday. Right. Um, is that the 28th, this this Thursday? This, this Thursday will be, let's see. Yes, it's the 28th. 28th yeah, of the tw October. Uh, yeah, September. September. Yeah, so I'm actually attending court on the 28th because a paying parent, I, obviously I can't divulge the details, um, but she has been hit. So this actually affects women as well, where right. the man has custody of the child. So it's not, okay. it's not, it's not just gender based in terms of mm. it just goes after men. This mm. is big business. What we're talking about here, Marcus, huge business. So oh, cool. she had her case adjourned. She's going back to court on Thursday. Um, and it most certainly looks like that she's going to be sentenced to prison um, for a fictitious debt of 28,000 pounds.
and she's got all the evidence that she does not owe the money. How long has she? But, how long has she been sentenced to? No. So it's a sanction, and you you are sentenced for six weeks. So she won't actually spend any time in custody. She well, she will. Yeah, she. I mean, she'll have to do half of six weeks. Oh, so oh really? She's still going. It's not prison. being deferred or anything. She's not getting any any um, deferration on that. She's going to have to actually no. do time. She will actually have to do time. And then and after which time? Sorry, no. After which time? I take it as the debt cleared. The debt is not cleared. No. So she'll be back to square one. You're back to square one. The only thing that they can't do, obviously, the enforcement powers that they use against you, yeah. obviously, they can't sentence her to prison again because, obviously, that would be double jeopardy. Sure. She served her time. Yeah, she served her time for it. Um, but the debt certainly is not cleared, so then that will probably go back to bailiffs. Mm. Um, and then bailiffs will start tr knocking on your door, start trying to take your vehicle, trying to gain entry into your property. You know, all of these sort of it, it, an extremely stressful environment. Absolutely. The pressure that is put on a paying parent, Marcus, yeah. is, you know, you've got people constantly hounding you for money that you don't own, sure. and you can't get rid of it. And this is the frustration of paying parents, of of what is happening to them. They're they're, they're being in 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 essence they're being assessed mm -hmm. wrongfully. They're trying to challenge it. They've got no way of challenging it. And this enforcement process, this this absolute armory of enforcement powers, comes after you. And you've got no way out. No, and and hence we're looking at the report that Brian Hudson has done where he's mm -hmm. come up with a 1,300 or so deaths that he knows about. I mean, it's uh, average in the UK is four and a half to 5,000 suicides a year. Uh, and look at the situation we're in, in the UK, that we have rising cost of lockdown crisis, as I like to call them, not cost of, uh, cost of living. We have inflation still at 6%, 7%, but on food, it's around 20%. On fuel, it's still going up. I mean... These poor people must feel that they're in a no-win situation and they've got nowhere to go other than to take the tragic way out, no? Uh, yeah, and it, it, and it's just not something that's been highlighted at all in the press, and I can't understand why. Well, and, that, and that's what I can't understand. Well, the favourite target also... in the press is men, normally, mm. and uh, they, don't, they don't fit into any protected category. Uh, normally, unless they're of a certain religion or a certain sexual persuasion. So they're really fair game. And it's an absolute disgrace. But sickeningly, I'm not that surprised. But when you did the, the podcast with James English, I think a lot of people's jaws would hit the floor not in that situation. Because we're also dealing with men who are being accused of being fathers of children as well. And they they're denying it, but they're guilty as charged without any due process. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, and I mean, ironically, hmm. believe this or believe this not, since I've done the podcast with um, James English, the majority of people that are actually reaching out to me are really worried mothers. Right. They're wow. really worried about their children, about hmm. their sons. And the thing is, it's it's like one of it's this story is like one of these things that people don't. It's not that they don't care about it, but we we live in a society that's very fast paced. We're all very busy, you know. It's a hectic lifestyle. Whether you're battling traffic, roadworks, this that, whatever it might be, um, everything's so fast paced. And unless something affects you right here or right now, you don't really take that much notice of it. And I'm not saying that there's not public sympathy for this because there's massive public sympathy for this. And a lot of mothers are very concerned about this because what they're saying to me is, is my son could literally sleep with the wrong girl, get her pregnant, mm -hmm. and his life will be absolutely destroyed. Yeah. And their lives the parents' lives will also be destroyed with this as well because they're going to have to deal with their son or daughter mm. because it does affect women as well. Yes. And, you know, they're going to have to try and support them through the most horrendous nightmare of their lives. 
you know, when you're dealing with these sorts of things, it should be very easy. It should be a very, do we need to have state involvement in this? Do we need to have state involvement? Well, Why are the you, state getting involved you would, in, in parental disputes? You would like to think that men should be responsible for the children that they have. And that was the, that was the whole argument and narrative for the, the 1993 set up of the original child support agency under the John Major government role. Nobody would say that parents should shuck the responsibilities. And this goes with all colours and all creeds. These are, these, this isn't just a, a white indigenous problem, is it? This is a problem throughout every community in the UK. But I, I guess we'll just have to wait and see to see the, the people that want to come forward about this. But yeah, of course, the parents of the son who's allegedly had these children. Now, I take it the, these are fathers who have their, their names on the birth certificates of the children. Are there any cases where they're disputing that they're even the fathers? Yes, we. I mean, there is cases out there, and um, uh, Anne Widdicombe has covered one of the cases. That's Anne where... Widdicombe, former Conservative minister, now in the Reform Party. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. And she's got a column in the Daily Express, and she has covered in the Daily Express. She's quite vocal about how the child maintenance service operates. Mm. Um, and we certainly know of fathers that have been sent to prison um, and it's later been determined afterwards that they're not even the father of that child. How can you get a DNA test? How can you get a fair DNA test if you're not being allowed contact to that child? Yes. Does, the, that, 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 that makes, makes sense. no sense whatsoever, does it? That, that's, that's really, that's beyond persecution when you think of well, it. Fathers have been sent to prison mm -hmm. where right. it's been proven afterwards that they're mm -hmm. not um, the father of that child. Mm -hmm. Um, and do you want to know how much compensation they received? Net zero. A hundred pound. Oh, a hundred pound. Oh, they got, they, got, they got like a ton. But what we're seeing in society at the moment is a completely medieval system mm. where it's, oh, the mum should be at home doing the washing up, doing the ironing, you know, and the dad should be going out there and paying all of this money to keep mum at home. You know, but maybe there's a lot of mothers out there that want to go and, and 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 make themselves better. Why does the system hold them back? Well, so you're... it's a medieval system yeah. that we're seeing at the moment, <clears throat> which is all run by Jurassic judges. But we talk about equality. Where's the equality in that? There is none. What what we're seeing that's really worrying, though, it's funny, you mentioned medieval periods. What we're seeing is the, the state and the regulators behaving like the, the sheriff of Nottingham, that they can dip in and take whatever they want, whenever they want, without an excuse, without a, a buy your leave. They can come in and clear your accounts and you have little recourse. And, and we just have to look at, you know, the, the financial regulators and all the all the regulators, but let's just stick to the financial authority um, at the moment that, that uh, the other day, to bring this story in the financial conduct of authority, the FCA basically found that they, they couldn't see any wrongdoing in the... Nigel Farage case and the Coots Nat West debanking situation where 300,000 people came forward to Nigel and said that their bank accounts had been closed. That regulators said in return, we have no record of this whatsoever. A precarious situation. Well, us, I mean, us, well, us reform, reform yep. UK, and reform. our leader Richard Tice was very vocal about this in the press. We were debanked by the Metro Bank. Because we didn't fall in line with their with their policies. Sure. Our political, you know, our political beliefs or our political policies didn't fall in line with their the policies. Environment, like environmental, social governance, the ESG or other people yeah. reference die. Have you heard about die? No. Diversity, diversity, inclusion, and equality. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, a hundred. And die is die is basically what these people do financially and spiritually, mm. and some of them, as the report from Brian Hudson has done. It's causing people to die, quite literally, from the stress and the pressure that this is actually creating. No, you must you must think that this where where is this country going? You must pinch yourself some time and think what the Ferrari is going on. Well, do, do you know what, Marcus? I've 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 had this conversation, you know, with with close family members and people that are very close to me and support me, and you know, with and all of my efforts. Yeah. Um, 
and also, you know, discuss this in great detail with members of reform as well. And what we've become, we've become a right horrible little country. And that is pretty much the only way that I can sum it up. Mm. You know, there, I, there's so much wrong with our country. Yeah. It's hard to put your finger on something and say mm. that's actually right. And, and what an you easy know, touch we are. What an easy touch we are from everyone from all parts of the world that get everything set up to them, get everything given to them. And now the people of this country don't have seemingly less and less recourse through the courts or through the, re the regulatory authorities. And when your authorities are like the Ofcom, Ofgem, you're dealing with the FCA, all they're doing is turning a blind eye to these corrupt practices. Yes, the Reform Party, people like the Reclaim Party, the Heritage Party, freelance journalists or independent news outlets like Herd Immunity News know we are shining a spotlight on this because we feel exactly the way you do. But what we've found, Noel, is that the vast majority of people in this country want something done about it. And I think what you're getting at and what we certainly do is, it's an old story, but together we can actually do something about this. Is that fair? Yeah, I mean, look, you know, from the support that I've received regarding the ULES and, the, you know, the ULES, you know, like I've said, you know, and I've been very vocal about that, you know, I never saw myself as becoming like a Robin Hood mm -hmm. of, you know, the people. I just never saw it. You know, I, I was just a, a normal working class lad, you know, who was just going about his business every day um, and was hugely affected by one of the policies of the state. Um, and what I'm seeing at the moment is that people are very angry really really angry and it's just this you know child maintenance service is just a fraction of what's going on in our society it is a huge scandal and i believe that it's one of the huge biggest scandals and there's going to be a lot more that's coming out over the coming weeks regarding this mm. um and i do believe that it's one of the biggest scandals that we've ever experienced in the united kingdom um you know and you know currently at the moment i just see that we're we're on a path to destruction. Yeah. And unless people actually stand up and say, you know, enough, of, I mean, we've been invaded. Yeah. We've got boats coming across. Uh, you know, we've got all this going on with net zero. Mm -hmm. we, NHS uh, waiting uh, list. You know, we're paying the highest taxes in seven years. GDP, yeah, the NHS waiting list. I mean, the NHS is finished. The NHS currently as it stands at the moment is completely finished. It's yeah. not working for all of us that are paying for it. That, that's the thing that I don't understand. Everybody who's paying for it is having to pay for the NHS, but also pay for their private medical care. Yeah. My mum being one of them. My mum's a pensioner. Yeah. She's contributed her whole life into the system, never taken a penny off the state. She cannot get a doctor's appointment, and she's having to pay her own private medical um, cover to, to, to go and see a doctor. Mm -hmm. Just normal things that we used to have. And that's what I'm saying. As a country... There's just so much wrong. You know, we've got the police that just don't investigate crime anymore. Yep. You know, you've got Suella Braverman who's saying to the police, can you go back to work, please? But we're all paying for that. Mm. Us, the taxpayers, mm -hmm. we're all paying for that. Every single one of us. And we're paying through. We're paying the highest taxes in the world. We are. We're being absolutely and heisted, robbed. Businesses are closing down. People are being attacked for money. Uh, as this example is shining, shining a light under, people are being attacked for money they don't have, and they're being no money up they for. don't owe. Sorry, Marcus, money they don't owe. money, yeah. money, money they that owe. they do not owe, yes. and and that is the key question here. Yeah. But just coming back to mm -hmm. the Hudson report, what he also did, he concluded. I don't know if you've got that report there in front of you. What he also concluded, which I think is very very serious, and it's this bit here where I, I do believe that the public are fully going to concur with what I'm saying. Yeah. So over the pandemic, enforcement had reduced by 28% because obviously they weren't in the offices and, you know, whatever they do, you know, they were working from home. So the enforcement had reduced by 28%, but the mortality rate had also reduced by 27.5%. Now, do you believe in coincidences? Yeah, well, it's funny how many coincidences there seem to be, isn't there? 
there's, there's conspiracy theory, but there's also co coincidence, coincidence theorists that just want to turn a blind eye to everything. And just having a look at yeah Brian's Brian's report, which he's posted, and we will leave we will leave the links to that. This man has had to do this at his own risk in his own time and constantly go for freedom freedom of information requests because this information from the child maintenance services is being withheld. It's a very very detailed report, isn't it? And. You know, yes. I've spoken to Brian. I've spoken to Brian about this report, and he's been very vocal. And he's saying, if I'm wrong, he said, why are they not challenging me? The statistics of that report and the data, mm. you know, that he has produced, the only reason why they've not challenged him on that report is because it has to be true. Well, he wants to bring it to the public's knowledge. He wants to bring it into the into the zeitgeist. And... It touches on the, the the power that the financial controllers have, and all the regulators have, and that's why I keep coming back to the examples that we've just seen very recently from the financial regulators in this country when they completely turn a blind eye to over three hundred thousand bank accounts being closed, like they didn't even happen, and it was all just a dream. It was all a lie. So that there's a kind of war going on right now, really, between the financial, between the regulators, the government, the government agencies that are go, that have gone rogue, um, and the Home Office included in that, the National Health Service, the the Ministry for Education, the uh, the Ministry of Defence, right across the board, there isn't one function of British government that's actually working for us. They're working against us. Is that fair? Yeah. Yes, I, 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 I do. I firmly believe. I mean, you know, we employ a border force. And when I say we employ, it is us because we're the taxpayers. We're paying for it. Of course. Yeah. We're paying their wages, so we employ them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So border force. We, I, I don't remember any time at all that we voted in either a Labour or a Conservative government where they said, we're going to pick illegal immigrants up in the channel and yeah. we're going to ferry them across. Yeah. And, and, we're gonna, and we're going to feed them. Yeah. We're going to house them. We're going to provide coach service. We're going to provide taxi service. We're going to provide Domino's pizza on tap. Mm -hmm. The list is endless. Take them to Anfield on the tours. Yeah, take them mm -hmm. to Anfield on tours. Yeah. I, I don't recall any of us voting for that. I actually think we voted against that. We did. If the referendum was anything to go by, yeah. I think the British people voted completely against that. So currently what we're witnessing and what we're seeing at the moment is the state fully going against its own people. Yeah. And I think that's a very dangerous place to be, Marcus. It is. Well, I, I've reported it heavily on the activities of a group known as the Blade Runners. And these are a group of people who have said, look, you've provided evidence that's completely flawed the Imperial College London report, 4,000 deaths a year, that's been completely debunked uh, on large part by Howard Cox of the Reform Party. He's a London mayoral candidate for next year's election. Richard Tice, the leader of Reform Party, which you're a spokesman for in Hebel Hampstead. And they have done an amazing job, in, and others, in showing that these scientific reports were all based on completely flawed information, lies, let's call them what they are, no, lies. Uh, vast sums of money, a million pounds was paid to Professor Gary Fuller, for example, also Frank Kelly of Imperial College London. They get paid to come up with an answer so the narrative can be put forward to Transport for London to fleece hard-up drivers and motorists of up to 400 to 500 million pounds. And we're seeing these rogue elements some people are calling them gangsters now. That's all these people are. It's basically it's uh, extortion with menaces. When you get the bully boys coming round to the door, you've got these agencies, they're all like nightclub doormen and the likes of them, uh, and they're just going for it, aren't they? They're, they're like parasites. Is that fair? Um, I mean, look, <clears throat> when it comes to debts, because obviously... This is what I've been investigating for the last five years and mm. researching debt. 
And I would certainly say that there's no checks and balances regarding debts that are owed and debts that have been collected. Um, and it boils down to the fact, where is the financial conduct authority, whether it's uh, bailiff regulators, whether it's bank regulators, whether it's any regulator at the moment, they're not regulating. But if the police are not policing, uh -huh. then why are these people going to regulate? So everything that we're seeing in the United Kingdom is absolutely rotten, and therefore it needs reform. It, everything needs reforming from everything from our energy to our economy, to our police, to our border controls. Every single thing needs reforming. Is Keir Starmer going to be the answer to this? Of not. To, the, to of not. all of our problems. Yeah. SNP, it, 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 Liberal Democrats, that's the problem. People have given up on the entire political system and the democratic system, and they're taking matters into their own hands now publicly. We can't condone anyone chopping down cameras, for example, anyone disabling equipment that allows Mr. Khan to fleece drivers, but they've taken it amongst themselves to say, we're backed up into a corner now, right? We have nowhere to go. Now the gloves are off, right? That's it. The social contract that's existed between the governed and the government, that's us and them. That's what it's boiled down to. There's no left wing. There's no right wing. It's us. That's you and I know, and the rest of the British people and them, the people who are taking everything we've got, leaving people in a no-win situation where they feel they have to take direct democracy, civil disobedience. I think, uh, look, I still think, I'm not saying there is, isn't a way, there is a way out of this. And it is through collective activity and collective action. It's also through political activity, of which you're a big part of. But also looking at our legal experts, looking at the courts, looking what you did. We we spoke with Giovanna De Stefano, who's a controversial lawyer, but he's he has some fantastic results and big big uh, victories. All he he likes to frame it, Noel, is that he didn't win those cases. The government lost those cases. The Crown Prosecution Service lost those cases. In major cases like Nicholas Van Hoodstrat and then John Goldfinger Palmer. These are some of the richest men in the country at the time, and he won. But he's basically come out and said that with these fines or charges cannot be enforced without a conviction. And there is still a way to, I'm going to look into this and use his legal expertise, whatever people may think of it, they can take it or leave it. Just like your advice, they can take it or leave it. But at least it gives them an insight into what can be done. Because other than that, they're going to feel uh, uh, there's nowhere to go and they'll take their own lives. In the UK, the last recording figures we've got, no, is at four and a half to 5,000 people a year take take their own lives. Tragic situation, it should never happen and 75% of those are men. But when they're facing things like this, they're looking down the barrel of a gun. The regulators won't help, the courts won't help, they feel that they've got nowhere to go other than to take the, mo the most terrible decision they can is to take their own lives. We will definitely look into this for you with our legal advisors. Uh, I mean, that that would be absolutely fantastic. I mean, and it, it would really help. I mean, what, what I've been most alarmed at is the clip that James English uh, published on one of his reels of mm -hmm. our interview was the tragic case of Gavin Briggs. Yes. Yeah, that was the real tragic case tell us about, two about tragic gavin. cases but... sorry tell us a bit about the case please no but gavin so gavin um served his country mm -hmm. you know he was a, a beautiful uh boy he was paying for two children uh through a court order and the child maintenance service got involved and he was a train mechanic and gavin was assessed at seventy six and a half thousand pounds, but he was a train mechanic, and he was also given fifteen thousand nine hundred pounds of arrears on top as well. But he was paying for two children through a court order. So how can one child mm. cost that amount of money? It makes no viable sense whatsoever. So this was back in, I, I think it was July 2020 or July 2021. Can't I can't remember the exact year. Um, and because of the pressure 
mm. that the child maintenance service were putting on him. So he was already paying for two children. So straight away, that draws into, this is what I, I, I'm always talking about, that they pick and choose the bits they like. Sure. So Section 2 of the Child Support Act is all about the welfare of a child or other children. So basically, when a caseworker makes a decision, um, they have to take into account other children that would be affected by that decision. So where he's already paying for two children for a court order, which he's mm -hmm. perfectly entitled to do because that was all part of his divorce settlement. You know, it's not a crime to get divorced. You know, you do it all legally and all above board. So that's what he was Happens. doing. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And then the mother of, you know, his other child went to the child maintenance service and they assessed him at £76,500. Which is way over, way over his, his wage. What, what but common roughly sense was... would tell you, yeah. common sense would tell you sure. when they look at his occupation that he's a train mechanic. So he's not a Harley Street surgeon. Doubled it, he's... tripled it. Yeah, he's not a Harley Street surgeon, is he? Sure. No. You know, he's he's just not earning that sort of money. They don't no. earn that sort of money. No. And I've spoken to his father, Ian Briggs, about this. Um, you know, and he's kind of gone into the detail. It's taken him a long time because, you know, Ian, as a result of this, has had his life destroyed as well. Of course. And Ian, you know, when he told me about what Gavi did, you know, I always get a lump in my throat every time I tell this story. Um, and Gavin, the night he took his own life, he got a sandwich, went off in his car, bought a disposable barbecue, he lit that barbecue in the back of his vehicle and he sat in there and he poisoned himself. I mean, your state of mind to do that, Marcus. Yeah. I, I don't know what his state of mind would have been. Thankfully, yeah. I've never been in that position. I mean, I've had demons like everybody else. Sure. But what I keep thinking about regarding that is when he's in that vehicle and he's poisoning himself, mm. at any time he could have got out of that vehicle. Mm -hmm. But he didn't. And I mean, I I can't imagine the sort of headspace, you know, that Gavin, you know, would have been in at that time to be under that sort of pressure. But the only thing that I can think about is that they left him with 120 to 150 pounds a month to live on. Impossible. And he had no alternative. Impossible. And he served his country. He's a young man. If you, I just, you just Google the average salary. No, I've just done it. The average salary of that. You see, he was a railway technician, a railway mechanic. The average salary in a Google is thirty-one thousand pounds, right? And that takes two seconds to look at. So what they've done is double or two and a half times uh, Gavin's salary, and he, he's felt that he has absolutely nowhere to go. He's looked at every way of fixing this. He's a smart guy. He's a tough man. He served his country loyally, put his life on the line for his country. And this is what and he gets. And that's the repayment he's got. That's this is the what repayment. he gets. Kicked in the teeth repeatedly to death. And that's how I see it. And I'm mm. sure, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you must see it the same way. The state are responsible for his death. Now, you've got another story for us. Could you tell us a little bit about that one, please? Yeah. So the other tragic story was the case of uh, Johnny O'Neill. Mm. And I talked to his sister very regularly, Joanne. Beautiful right. family. Mm -hmm. You know, they're from up north. You know, just, just going about their everyday business. I talked to the mum quite a bit as well, you know, and I update her with my progress and my work. Um you know, just a beautiful, beautiful family. They really are. Mm -hmm. And you can see how close Joanne and John Boy, she calls him. Mm -hmm. So we'll refer to him as John Boy. Sure. And you can just see the brotherly and sisterly love that they had for each other. And he was paying for one child mm -hmm. 700 pounds a month. My God, 700 pounds. What did he do, if you don't mind me asking? What did John Boy do? He, he, was, inv he was involved in something to do with, like, industry. He, it, it was something, you know, he, but he wasn't earning a lot of money. 
Right. He was earning, you know, roughly about a thousand pounds, clearing about a thousand pounds a month. Obviously, because up north, um, you know, things are a lot cheaper than what they are down south. So, you know, the wages would reflect how people live, you know, up north. But being left with eight and a half grand a year than, out of his salary, eight and a half grand a year is a lot of money. It's a lot of For, money, but they also gave him arrears as well of three thousand pounds. Right, so he's looking at over, he's looking at eleven and a half thousand pounds. Exactly, but the big elephant in the room here mm. is what they were doing, and the CMS have admitted to this through subject access request. They're not allowed to take more than forty percent of your salary. That's right. They're not allowed by law yeah. to take more than forty percent. Right. So they've even admitted that they were taking more than forty percent of. Uh, John Boy's salary. That is, where are the checks and balances? Well, aren't where is the accountability? And I'm for, uh, well, very, very tragically, yes. what John Boy did. I mean, for me, that showed real strength and real courage to do what he actually did the night that he took his life. And I'll let Joanne talk to you about that. Mm. He left a suicide note on Facebook and he said, I really, really hope that by doing what I'm doing is going to stop the child maintenance service from doing to other fathers. I mean, that's a massive statement to make. And where are the coroners? Where, are, where is the investigation into that? Why is this all so, so silent? He's categorically stated on a public forum mm. that he was going to take his own life. Mm. And he said the reasons why he was going to do it. And he's named the child maintenance service. Where, where, where is everyone? Where, where is everyone, Marcus? I, I, I genuinely don't know. How old was John Boy, roughly? Um, he was in his 30s. In his 30s. Same so. as Gavin. Another young man with absolutely nowhere to go, nowhere to turn. So he's put himself in the, that spot of isolation, desolation, and taking his own life without anyone being able to reach through to him and, and try and give him any way out, any sort of light at the end of the tunnel, if you like. That's the problem that, that these chaps are occurring. They think they're going to get a fair shake, don't they? They think they're going to have their day in court and due process but they're, they're, they've been left to such uh, dire straits that nothing can be done in their eyes and they've taken their life and, and what John Boy's done and what he's written is very noble as you correctly say no 100% agree with you he's left a message for others and you've you've picked up on this and I'm so glad you have because we'll do everything we can to shine a light under this crime is what it is. It's criminal neglect. And it is by, these are by state agencies because we can't sugarcoat this. No, I'm sorry. I know that there's political ways to do things and say things, but other than naming and shaming those responsible, we're going to get bloody nowhere. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. And I mean, I, I make no bones about it. You know, um, you know, the director of the child maintenance service, mm -hmm. um, you know, was Arling Thugden. Right. She's been named as many as Arling Thugden. Arlene Thugden. Arling Thugden. Yep. We'll put that put that out there. Yeah. Um, and the minister for work and pensions at the mm -hmm. time was Baroness Stedman Scott. Baroness Stedman Scott. Baroness. Yeah, Baroness Stedman Scott. And when all of the, uh, when the Hudson report was published, they were in charge of the child maintenance service. Mm -hmm. And from what I've seen, the campaign that they've led was totally rogue. She's a conservative no member of the House of Lords. She's got an OBE. Just checking her out just now. Baroness Deadman Scott, conservative member of the House of Lords, OBE, former chief executive officer to a group called Tomorrow's People Trust. 
she's done a hard day. She's had a hard life, hasn't she? She really has, poor thing. And and we've just we just have a look and have a have a, a little look at it and look over her career. She's a former employee. Stedman Scott worked at at Nat Westminster Bank. She's from the banking sector. There you she, go. Were, she was part of the Salvation Army. And then she moved on to the Chamber of Commerce. She's worked for charities all her days, meant to be a, a champion for the people. And we go down to what we've just heard from you today, that she was involved directly with these cases where de departments and agencies like the Child Maintenance Service have gone completely rogue. Is that mm -hmm. fair to say? Absolutely. And it, you know, yet again, it's not coincidence, is it? That when Stedman Scott mm. was Under Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, mm -hmm. and when Arlene Sugden was the Director of the Child Maintenance Service, that, you know, through that time of the Hudson Report, was the mortality rate was extremely high. Right. Because it was on their watch that they were collecting the arrears. It was on their watch. They've been collecting the arrears, but they were under a lot of pressure by the National Audit Office to close the accounts. So it was pretty much a free-for-all. And all I was seeing is people coming to me with cases, no, I've had £6,000 of arrears. I've had 3000 It's all, all kind of like even numbers as well. It's like three, six, nine. You know, these are the patterns, 12. 16, 19,000, it's, it's huh. all these kind of figures. To, to add insult to injury, we're doing a little bit more deep diving as we speak on Debbie Stedman Scott. She's claiming on one of her websites to be an ambassador for an organization called Make Justice Work. Right. And this is all about forcing through things like diversity, inclusion, gay and lesbian rights. Um, I mean, we can't really say too much, but we'll, we'll obviously have to put up a picture of her. People can make their own conclusions when they see things like that. Obviously, you can't judge a book by its cover, but we'll we'll leave it to our viewers and listeners to to have a little look at. Um, this is completely disgusting. It's completely hypocritical when they're claiming to be these champions, no, of justice and fairness. Where was the fairness for John Boy? Where was the fairness for Gavin? I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. And thousands of others. Thousands of others, yeah, and God rest them, as we say this, there's a massive number of people taking their own lives, and a lot of that is through poverty, through being persecuted, through agencies, debt-collecting agencies, and these government departments that turn a blind eye to hundreds of thousands of people, like the financial regulators, the Financial Conduct uh, Authority. There is no conduct. There is no authority. But the financial side is definitely guaranteed. People are being fleeced. They're being fleeced to death. Literally having nowhere to go. We bang on about the Blade Runners because they've actually, they're a group of people who have actually said, no, sod you. You're ripping us off. You're, you're, you're dipping into my account. I've got to feed my wife and kids. Mothers are out there driving as well. Got to get to my elderly mom, my elderly parents. You're fining me. You're fining me on lies. These people are taking money off these men on projections, like the forecasting done during the the COVID era, like the forecasting done by Imperial College London. So we're great. We're experts. You're dumb. You're going to get shafted, and there's no recourse. Well, that's not good enough. No, we ain't having it, mm -hmm. are we? No, and and you know what. The thing is, it's absolutely fine. And obviously, I can't condone, you know, any criminal behavior or anything like that. And there are. No. Nope. Yeah. And there, there is absolutely a lot of other processes, you know, sure. that the public can, you know, can yeah. use. Because I use those processes and it worked for me. Exactly. Surprising. And I was very, very surprised that a judge sided with me on the ULES case because I knew it was going to be such a massive ruling. And I knew one day that that ruling would come back to bite the state on the bum. You know, I knew yes. that. So there are processes in place. And what I would say to everyone, you know, just to round this up. Yeah. 
what you it's okay to say no mm -hmm. and it is absolutely fine to say no and it's fine to push back mm -hmm. and what people have to do they have to be big and brave because everybody on reform are all like me mm -hmm. every every everybody has the same beliefs as me everybody thinks the same as me you know and nobody's got their own agenda and everyone that i've spoken to on reform all of their PCs or their official spokespeople, you know, they all have the same views. They all have yeah. the same ideas. And most of them all come from a working class background as well. And like I say, I'm not discrediting anybody that's been to Eton. I'm not discrediting anybody that's been to Oxford, sure. you know, because do you know what? I, I always take my hat off to people like that. You know, what they've gone off and achieved with their degrees, their bachelors, et cetera, et cetera. You know, that takes you know, a certain mindset to do that. So I'm not discrediting them, but what I am questioning is what life experiences have these politicians have to make these rules, to make these policies, when do they actually understand how hard it is every single day and the stresses and the pressures that normal parents have every day, people who are going to work, people who are trying to better their lives, Let's look at just even benefits. You know, we've currently at the moment, we've got an absolute pandemic of people on benefits, you know. We do. And, and no money to pay for it. And no manufacturing to pay for it. Our, our percentage of spend from our GDP on the state is up to 46%. It's the highest it's ever been. And this is from a conservative government. As you say, people have actually... And they're at their wits' end. So that's why the political parties are all fine and well, and, and we salute you and, and the great people like Howard Cox, uh, Ben Habib, yourself, Anne Widdicombe. These are the people that are championing these things, uh, these causes every single day. And, you know, with all due respect to reform, yes, we hope that they get some MPs in, but I think we've both agreed that even to get five to 10 MPs would be a hell of a result because... Come every election. It would be monumental. It would, it be. would be monumental for it would us. Be. It would be. And we wish them every success. And I, th I think we're at the end. You know, I, I don't think it's, I think, I think the death has happened. I you think saying, we're at the are end. Are you saying UK um, is on death row? I, I believe it is. UK is on, on death our, row. Our current, I, 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 I absolutely believe that. You yeah. look at the state of this, and we were the empire once. We're now the laughing stock of the world. You know, a terrorist was recently was able to get on the bottom of a, a Serco van and yeah. out the gate he went. I mean, that's yeah. an embarrassment. That is an international embarrassment. It is. That was from Wandsworth that, Prison. I, I, I'm sorry. That was from Wandsworth Prison. Our, the prison Wandsworth Prison. Ronnie Biggs yeah. escaped from. I mean, the, the oldest 60s. trick in the book. Yeah. The oldest trick in the book got yeah. underneath, you know, the, the, the Serco van yeah. or whatever van it was goes out the gate and mm. that's him gone, uh, yeah. you know, and yes, he was on remand. He wasn't convicted. Mm. I get all of that, but he was in the British army and the allegations that have been made are really serious allegations. Yeah. He was a terrorist who got you into know, the British army. National security. He was a terrorist a te and through, through the capita checking that would tell the likes of me to do one because I was part of the Brexit party. If I wanted to go in as a reservist, um, I'd be pushing it, but, you know, I might just get it under the wire. They'd, they'd say, me, do one, mate. But because this guy's been a terrorist, they didn't have the wherewithal. Capita we're talking about. These are the recruiters for the British Army. They couldn't find out that this guy was actually an enemy of our state. And then he escapes from what's made to be one of the top security prisons in the UK. In fact, he wasn't in a top security prison, even though he was identified as a terror suspect. It just gets more and more ridiculous. You, you think, well, I'm sorry, you're either completely incapable and incompetent or you have willfully malintent towards the people of this country, like the open borders. We see these stories all the time about people that come across, they're rejected from other countries, like the Netherlands, like Holland, like Denmark. Uh, there was the chap that, that murdered the young um, Marine in Bournemouth. Did you hear about that story? Mm. He came over and all the thought he was... I, I, I certainly did. Thought he was 15, he was actually 19, and he was wanted for uh, two shootings, two murders over in Denmark. Mm. They said they wouldn't take him, but the UK said, yeah, come on in, mate. You're more than welcome to come on in. Now, who's responsible for that boy's death? Who's responsible for consoling his parents? I'm sorry, it has to come back the to states. those people who were responsible, who the flicked states. it through. It's the state. 
In aviation, if you were to pour in the, the wrong mix into an engine, the wrong coolant, I'm, I'm digressing to make this point. In aviation, there are very strict laws. If you were to pull in, pour in the wrong coolant and a 747 came down or a new treble seven Boeing electric Dreamliner, if that crashed, they would trace it back to you if you were the mechanic mm. and you'd be done for corporate manslaughter. You'd do time. In the UK, no one's doing any time for any crime other than what it seems is innocent people being chased for money. They do not owe. I, I, a hundred percent. And, and you know what? We've become so desensitized to corruption that we just accept it now. In, yeah. We don't need to accept it. We can push back against it. You know, it's absolutely fine. And, you know, just, just, cut, you know, drawing on, you know, what you were just talking about there mm. with illegal immigration, obviously, you know, reform have, you know, a really, really good plan, you they know, do. to combat illegal immigration, you know, and it's it's just pretty much following, you know, the Australian process and the various conventions, you know, that we've signed up to. But, you know, on a, on a personal note, you know, with these people that are coming across, when people say to me, but what would you actually do? I would just say I would do nothing. Okay. I would do nothing. Just I, leave them, leave them to their own devices. Marcus, just leave them. Yeah, no money, no anything. What are they going to do? Just sit there on the beach? Well, I would just rolling. do nothing. That's sad. Sadly, no. What they'll do is what they always do, and what they do from where they come from. Not all of them, of course, um, but a vast majority of them are on the run. I like what Poland are doing. To be honest with you, Poland have a net zero. I know Richard is Richard Teich, the leader of the Reform Party, also has a great policy of net zero immigration. We're full. I'm sorry, we can't take any more. We're actually tipping out students now, up in uh, Huddersfield. Students had paid for their accommodation though, in the swanky, nice little designer. Mm studio flats and they were tipped out on the street after paying for their accommodation to accommodate migrants that just arrived i mean this these are the students that probably had signs up saying migrants welcome borders welcome mm. until it's on your door until it actually comes to bite you but then it's too late i like poland's mm. attitude towards mass immigration it's zero we don't have any illegal migrants because we don't allow them we turn them back to wherever we found them and we just take them to the nearest country whether it be Germany, Austria, wherever, they're getting them. And they've got very strict, uh, strict border controls. But they also follow your line of thinking. They don't do anything for them. But sadly, you'd get people robbing, stealing, sleeping on the streets, tents. You'd always get care for Cali and groups like that, wouldn't you, coming forward with tents and money and funds? Which, which Marcus, yes, sir. which is totally their prerogative. And this is... You know what what you know what you get when you live in a free world, free society. Yeah. But and what I also don't have a problem with, those that want them can pay for them. Sure. What look, how's so them? If if what Care them? for Calais wanna set up accommodation and people wanna fund it with their own I don't have a problem with that either. You know, and that's what you get when you live in a free world. Yeah, everything is a choice. But you know. There's no way that you and I should be expected to pay for people that are coming here illegally. That is a crime. You have entered our country illegally. There is no other way, two ways about it, you know, or you get rid of borders completely. It is criminal. You're a criminal, no, like breaking an entry into someone's house. You're not, you don't have permission to be there. Exactly. Mm. A a hundred, hundred million percent. And I was listening to that, um, MEP, he was on with Nigel Farage the other night. Um, the the Polish MEP yes. uh, is, is it M- Marcus Delansky or, or something. I think his name was. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll look that. Yep. I, I'm not absolutely 100 percent sure on on the pronunciation of his name. And and, and I mean, he, you know, he was very very clear on you know what Poland's policy is on illegal immigration, and he didn't pull any punches whatsoever. You know, Dominic said, Tarinsky. Currently... Dominic Tarinsky is a guy. That's name. it, Dominic. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, and he was very, very vocal. He was very to the point. And the language that he used, even mm. Nigel Farage was like, you know, if we were to use that language here in the United Kingdom, you know, I don't think it would go down too well. But so what? He wasn't saying anything hateful. He was no. Sorry. 
He said, so what? He said, look, my job is to control and keep Holland safe. Your job in Britain is to do the same. Your first priority, any member of parliament, is for the people who live there now, not new people that want to come in who you know nothing about. And as we've seen already, a lot of these people are on the run. No, they, they will need to get out of their own mm -hmm. countries because they're wanted for murder. They're wanted for rape. They're wanted for a litany of crimes. You don't know if they're a sinner. You don't know if they're a saint. There is That means there is absolutely no way you can say with confidence that they're not a threat to this country and its national security. That's what he was putting on Nigel. And then Nigel is in the insidious position that he works for a company that are part of the Ofcom regulations. They would shut him down in nanoseconds, wouldn't they, if he said, yes, I agree with you, dear boy. Everything you say is pearls of wisdom coming from your mouth. Nigel would be cancelled. Uh, absolutely. You know, absolutely. And I mean, you know, he, he clearly stated, um, you know, that they've had no terrorist attacks whatsoever right. in Poland. Mm -hmm. That's a fact. You know, Crime rates is nearly zero, no? Rates, exactly. stabbings. That's exactly. coincidence. That's coincidence, no? Exactly. And I've said it many, many times, Marcus, yeah. including what's going on with the child maintenance service, what we're seeing here in the United yeah. Kingdom is a complete social breakdown and social devastation. It is. From top to bottom, and I'm going to confirm what I said to you before, we've become a right horrible little country. We have. And look, we, we, we'll draw up to a conclusion there because we've we have got off and talked about spoken about different subjects but you can't avoid doing that unfortunately because it's a it's a rot knoll that sadly set in in this beautiful great country of ours with fantastic people it seems at the very top of the pyramid that the corruption has gone off the scale and these people are drunk on power in the last couple of minutes is there anything you want to say to your to your viewers and the herd immunity viewers before we we thank you and and the park. Um, I would definitely say for everybody to start, like, you know, hitting me up on my socials, you know, if yeah. they believe in my cause, start supporting me. You know, the more support I get, the more public support that I get, you know, and I've always said it, you know, the government and the state are who they are, mm -hmm. but the power of the people will always win. Mm -hmm. And 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 the power of the people will always, always win. You know, we we you know, we are the people. And if you've got the power of the people, you can succeed with what, what it is that you want to do. So, you know, if you do believe in what reform are all about, what I'm all about, people need to get behind us and really start supporting us. And let's get traction. Let's get momentum. And let's start changing all of the things that are wrong with our country. We all want to live our lives in peace and harmony, earn a living, provide for our children, provide, you know, for your wives or whoever it might be. Sure. And... You, you know, you want to pay your bills and just get on with your life. And that's all that we want. We don't want all this state involvement and this high regulation and high taxes. Nobody wants it. Well said, Noel. And, and we'll echo what you just said. We will leave all the links to people who want to support you. We encourage everybody uh, from Herd Immunity News to, to support Noel, to look at his work to look at the projects that he's taking part in, the people that he's speaking with, the families he's trying to help, the battles he's constantly fighting, what Reform Party are doing, the cases involved, looking at um, Brian Hudson's report. We'll leave all of that on our links. We do it at the end of the video, but we encourage people to, to take a look at what Noel's doing. Noel Wilcox, the scaffolder who took on TFL and won. He's a Reform Party spokesman in Hamel Hampstead. And he means business, and he's a former. Uh, well, he's a he's he's a former and and serving. Um, I'm still I'm still I'm still a member of the um, um, army reserves. Right. So that's all, all something to salute and be very very proud of, and we're very proud to have you on the show. All that remains for me to say is, No Wilcox, thank you so much again, sir, for appearing on Herd Immunity News. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you. Take care, sir. And you.